This talk about uh, a tour of USB device controller UDC in the Linux system. So just a, a few words about, uh, about me. I am an embedded Linux engineer at Butlin. Uh, I work on the Linux kernel, also on bootloaders such as Uboot. And I contribute to the Renesas LZN1 USBF UDC controller in the kernel. I live in Toulouse, in the south of France. So I will start talking a little bit about the USB standard, and I will just focus on the USB 2.0 standards, not the USB 3 or even the OTG part, the really core USB 2.0. So the USB 2.0 standard is quite old standard. It was released 23 years ago. And it defines everything about the USB, from the mechanical part, to the electrical part, and also the communication protocols. It is publicly available at uh, USB.org, and it supports high speed, full speed, and low speed devices. So the USB bus, we have a host with its root web, and we can have multiple devices using some apps. Devices are unpluggable devices and discoverable devices on the uh, USB. Each device has a uniquely assigned address in order to communicate with. So the communication flow or USB transfer are initiated by the host. Most of bus transactions involve up to three packets. The first one, the token packet, the first packet in the transaction is here to identify the transaction and the recipient of the transaction using the USB device address and the endpoint number. You can have some data packets carry on the data related to the transaction and we can have some empty data packet and they are called the zero length packet. We have also uh, the upper limit, the max packet size in fact, it is the limit of the data packet, and it is uh, attached on each endpoint. Each endpoint has a max packet size. And the third uh, packet involved in the transaction is the unchecked packet, ACK, NAC, and STAR, <coughs> in order to indicate whether the uh, transfer was successful or not. So let's have a look at the standardized transfer, the transfer defined in the USB. The first one, the bulk transfer. So this transfer, this, uh, the system guarantees the delivery of this transfer, but there is no guarantee in terms of bandwidth or latency. Uh, they are present in both directions, in and out. Uh, this direction, in or out, is from the host's point of view. So in is from device to host, and on the other way, out from host to the device. So let's have a quick look on the, on the pattern here. So we have the in token, the in token, then the device can answer with the star if the endpoint is added or if an error is detected. A NAC is more to indicate that we are not ready to set the data and so please retry later. <coughs> Uh, when we have the data, we answer the in token with the data packet, and in return, the, um, the host acknowledge the, the transaction. The same from the, the other direction, output, with just the host sending the data packet. Another kind of transfer, the interrupt transfer. So in this case, there is a maximum service period guarantee. <laughs> and on any failure detected, the transaction will be retried on the next period. In fact, interrupt is just a periodic polling from the host. And you can see the pattern involved is exactly the same as the bulk transfers. Uh, Isochronous transfers, uh, there is in this case, in this case, uh, guarantee in bandwidth and in the uh, data rate. In fact, it's a chronos transfer of the periodic transfers in the USB world. Uh, and 
Also, you have to know that there is no retry in case of it in failure. And even there is no uncheck packet in an isochronous transfer. The last one, the most complicated one, and the mandatory one, is the control transfer. This transfer is used for any configuration, command, some status on the device. And it is made of three stages. The first one, the, step of the setup stage, made of the setup token and the related data, is here to identify the kind of request asked by the host. Then you have a status stage, so for instance, a control read, the status stage, the host requests the data, then the device sets the data, and on the control write, the opposite side, the host send the data. The last stage, the status stage, is here in order to acknowledge all the previous stages, so the setup and the data. And we have also some control transfer without any data stage. So we have only the setup stage and the acknowledge in order to acknowledge the status stage in order to acknowledge the uh, setup stage. So I use the word endpoint. It's now time to define what is an endpoint. <laughs> you lie. Okay, no? Is that better? Yes. Ah, good. <laughs> so, the, the endpoint the end is simply the terminus of communication between the host and the device. It is uniquely referenced in the system using the device address, the endpoint number, and its direction. We have one mandatory specific endpoint, which is the endpoint zero, and it is used to control the device. It is mandatory because there is a lot of requests defined in the USB standards that are th through this endpoint. We have the notion of interface. Interface is simply a group of endpoints providing a function. We can have several interfaces available at the same time on a, on a device. For instance, a multi-function device printer scanner device, we have so one interface for the printer part and an another interface for the scanner part. The configuration is much more the device capabilities. We have the power budget, the remote wake-up support, the number of interfaces present in this configuration. So one or more interfaces can be present in the configuration, but only one configuration can be activated. Whoops. So I, I told you the trans control transfer and through endpoint zero and the USB defines some of this transfer. In fact, on the left side, I extract the setup definition. The setup token is associated with a, a data for the setup stage and the data exactly maps this definition. So to identify the request, we have the request type and the request. We have a possible value, we have uh, an index, and a length of the data stage, the data present in the data stage. So if the length is zero, there is no data stage. On the right side, I extract from the standard some standard requests, such as create feature, get configuration, descriptor, get status, set address, quite important, set configuration, important too, and some others. The USB defines also some device states. So we, we have a, a quick look at, at them. A device can be in an attached state. In this case, it's just plug on the bus, but there is nothing more than just the, the connector plugged. The bus is not powered, so the V bus on the bus is not present. Another state, when the V bus is set, or asked to be set to the hub by the host on the, on the bus, the device is now in power state. In this state, it's not allowed to answer any transaction. It has to wait the USB reset to start handling transaction. 
When it receives this reset, it switches to its default state. In its state, it can only answer to the default USB address, the address 0, and only on its endpoint 0. <coughs> the host has to assign the unique USB address. To do that, he used the set address request, and when the device receives this, uh, this request, he switched to the address state. In this state, he has a unique assigned address and can only reply to, it, to transaction on this, using this address and only on endpoint zero. The other state, the configure state, the device received the set configuration request. In this state, all functions are available. The function presented in the interface is uh, available in the configuration chosen by the set configuration. All of these functions are available. The device answers all transactions or on involved endpoints and uh, using the previously assigned USB address. Suspended state, just a few words, the device enters in suspended state when it detects no bus activities during a specific period of time and it automatically releases the suspend state when it detects some bus activities. So a quite important step at the beginning of uh, life of the device on the USB is the bus enumeration. The, the goal of this process is to detect the device, assign an address, and configure the device. So all of this enumeration is done through standard request and this sequence is just the device is plugged, the bus is detected, the device connects the pull-up data line resistor. This connection is detected by the hub and informed to the host that there is a new device on the bus. The host asks for the hub to enable the bus, the port the device is plugged on, and to reset that port. Following the reset, the device is in default state. It answers to the default address. The host assigns the unique address, the set address request. The device uses this address. The host gets more descriptor and quite some more stuff. And at the end, send the set configuration request, switching the device to this functional state, I would say. So that said, let's have a look at the UDC. Part. First, the UDC is part of the USB gadget, but what is the USB gadget? USB gadget is simply Linux at the USB device. So it is composed of several parts, the gadget core handling all the common stuff, the upper layer providing the function, I will not talk about these upper layers, they are uh, their goal is to handle what is function specific. They also under some requests on endpoint zero. They are connected from, to other subsystems in the kernel, such as serial, uh, sound, net, and so on, to provide the, the function. Uh, here in this talk, we're going to look at the lower layer. The UDC part is, in fact, the hardware abstraction. Uh, the UDC driver are to manage the hardware, of course, under some setup request on endpoint zero and perform all the transfer asked by the upper layer in order to have a functional USB. So it's true, we have to include gadget.h, which in turn include ch9.h. It's quite a funny, funny name because ch9 is chapter 9 from the USB standard, and this either defines the structured the structure, the enumeration, all the important value is used from the, from the standard. We have to provide some hooks for device management, some other bunch of hooks for endpoint management, and of course we use some of the API USB core, gadget core function in order to register the, uh, the driver, signaling some events, and, uh, and so on. So let's have a look at the gadget operation. You can have the pull-up hooks, UDC start and stop hooks. UDC start and stop 
is called by the, the, the core when we going to use the UDC driver. So during this group, we have to do what is necessary at the hardware level in order to be ready to, to work. And if possible, we start the webas monitoring. The counterpart, UDC stop data to stop the UDC. Pull-up, pull up the gadget core asks us to connect the data line pull-up. So when it has to activate, we connect the pull-up. But be careful, this connection is detected by the hub and then the host, and it's the beginning of the USB activities. With this pull-up connected, we are going to start the bus enumeration from the host side. So be ready to handle these uh, activities. Uh, on the other side, when it's deactivated, the host will detect the uh, disconnection of this device, and so it will be no more used from the host point of view. The hooks related to endpoints. So enable, disable, allocating a request, free the request, queue and dequeue a request, and to other functions in order to control the endpoint. Enabling and disabling an endpoint. Uh, the endpoints chosen by the court in order to perform the, the function is chosen among a list of available endpoints provided by the UDC driver. We, we go that a bit later. So on enable, the endpoint had to be set up based on the endpoint descriptor passes parameters. We have to configure the other in order to handle this endpoint. On the disable, the endpoint we no more be used from the core, so the core has to disable. Now that we have to complete all pending requests, giving the request back to the USB gadget core, sorry. <coughs> After disabling an endpoint, the endpoint is not available anymore. Endpoint zero, the specific and particular one, is never enabled or disabled. It's always enabled, sorry, and never disabled. In fact, this Hooks will never be called for endpoint zero. Some control operations set alt and set wedge. So set alt, set or clear the endpoint alt feature. An alted endpoint will return a star on this transaction, indicating that I can do anything more. I am alted, so star. The host can use some request to get the status the endpoint alt status, and also to clear the alt feature if he wants to. Set wedge is pretty the same, except that the host cannot clear the endpoint alt using the alt feature. Only the gadget core using set alt zero can clear the alt state. Up. I thought about requests. So requests from the USB gadget work in C++ data exchange using an endpoint. They are chained using a queue per endpoint. And depending on the direction, for instance, on an in endpoint, device from host, again, the host point of view, they contain the data to send. So one request will spawn on one or more data packet, depending on the max packet size. And a zero length packet can be added if needed in order to terminate the, the data on the USB bus. On the other direction, the data request, we have the data received. So we receive data packets and merge them to the request up to the request size. And if we receive a zero length packet or a short packet, it terminates the request. Uh, data packet received also cannot be split to have a, a bunch of the data on one request and the other part on uh, another request. All the data received from one packet has to be in one request. When the request is terminated, we have to give it back to the core, so complete the request, simply calling the USB gadget give back request. So the endpoint hooks related to, re to requests, we can, or we have to allocate a request. So it is a time to set up some more hardware data in order to really 
close to the request, such as DME buffer, for instance, uh, an allocated request can be used several times. I mean, it can be queue and complete and requeue and recomplete, so several times using the same allocated request. Free request, the counterpart, just free the request, the request will be no longer used. So release the other specific resource and remove what it was done during the alloc request. Mm -hmm. Queuing a request. I, was, I said that the request are queued per endpoint for processing. So when the, the, the upper layer want to process a request, it's just called queue with the request. The requests are automatically removed from the queue at the end of processing by the UDC driver itself. Also at the end of processing, this end of processing is signaled to the core using the give back request. And don't forget when a request is queue, start the processing of the queue if it's not already done. On the queuing, the core asks us to dequeue a previous queued request. So we dequeue the request. We have to complete the request using the give back request with the status icon reset. And also don't forget if we dequeue the first one in the queue, don't forget to start the processing of the next one. We have not never stopped the queue processing, but just the queuing one in time in the queue. Some of the core API functions we, we use, so the classical one in order to register or non-register driver, uh, notifying the core about some specific event, the VBS event and USB reset, set the gadget state, give a request back to the core, uh, complete a request, and some one other, the setup hook in the USB gadget driver, it's quite important because it is the one we're going to call in order to delegate the endpoint zero uh, handling at the core level, core or ever going uh, upper in the layer at the function level. So my simple driver with this data, uh, bunch of data related to endpoint, my private data, my UDC, <coughs> with the array of endpoint, my bunch of hooks or operations related to the endpoint, and the one related to the gadget. And I need some endpoint information in order to give the list of available endpoints to the core. So this will be used during the probe, and we have to be careful, the endpoint name is quite important. You have a specific format, it's EPN something with N, the endpoint number that will be used for the transaction on the, on the USB. The endpoint capabilities, saying what kind of uh, features the endpoint can support in terms of transfer, control, back, interrupts, and so on and the max packet size limit, so the maximum value possible for the max packet size, or the upper limit of the max packet size value. Based on all of this stuff, it's time to probe. <laughs> so we have to initialize some of the gadget fields, the name, the max speed, the operation, and analyze the available endpoints. So we start with a, a disabled state that will be enabled later. We initialize the request queue, some endpoint fields, the endpoint capabilities, the max packet size limit. We set the specific endpoint zero, my UDC gadget endpoint zero is my endpoint zero. And we build the list of available endpoints for all the other endpoints. Once all this is done, just register the UDC driver. I tell you about some specific events on the bus, on the bus, the USB bus, the web bus, so the power supply, and the USB reset. So if we monitor web bus changes, you have to signal the changes to the core, and in turn, the core we call the pull-up hook in order to activate or deactivate the pull-ups. On USB reset, we have to complete all pending request if need, giving them back to the, to the, to the core. 
and uh, also that the speed is negotiated during an USB reset. So it's really time to get the current speed of the negotiated for the on the on the bus. We have to reset the address to the USB default address, signal the reset to the core, and also after the reset, only endpoint zero is available from any uh, transaction. No more, no other than endpoint than endpoint zero. So putting all together, we have the core wants to start, so we call the USB start, we're going to monitor the web bus. On the other side, the host power on the bus, so web bus is on on the bus, we detect the web bus, and signal that to the core using USB UDC VBUS handler. In turn, the core called pull up, so we prepare for the USB reset and connect the pull up. The pull up are connected, detected by the host, so the host starts its enumeration process, sending the reset. The reset is detected, uh, is on the bus, we detect the reset, we switch to the default address and call the core for signaling this reset. The host continues its enumeration process starting on endpoint zero transactions, some control transfers, they're on the bus and we handle some of them or delegate them at the at the core level. So how to handle the endpoint zero control request? Some of them I fully handled at the UDC level. There are the set address for unique address, the set and get status at device, set get status, so is there is no set status, get status at device and endpoint level, set and clear feature at device and endpoint, and endpoint level. All of the requests are delegated to the core. In order to do that, we have to call the setup function from the driver structure, giving the gadget information and control request. The control request is simply the data available in the data packet of the setup uh, stage on the control transaction. So the core performs what you have to perform and queue one request in the endpoint queue for the data stage or the status stage. If the data stage is needed, in or out, this request queued is for this stage. If there is no data stage, only setup and status stage, this request is for the status stage. Also, it can return USB gadget delayed status. In this case, it just tells us, hey, how well, I need to queue a status uh, request for the status stage, but I will do that later. Back to the UDC driver, where we have to process the queue, in or out, if it needed. And don't forget, we have the status stage. So at one moment, we need to send and receive the zero length packet related to the control status stage. For the other endpoint, it's pretty, pretty simple because everything is done on the upper layer at the core or the function level. So we just perform the data transfers without having any question about them. Just process the endpoint queue according to the endpoint direction. A few words now about uh, how to test all of this stuff. So I use test USB. It is described by linuxusb.org. Uh, I also wrote a blog post at Berlin related to these tools. And this tool is a quite old tool, but gives some results and it's pretty interesting to use. And it's Many executed on the host part. Host part, I mean the test tooling. Why we are a device, we need the host to communicate with us. So the host part is just the test tooling in this case. And on the host part, there is a dedicated kernel driver, USB test, and a user space program to ask the driver to perform some tests. It's USB. We have to note that the USB test can hang on some failures, and in this case, a reboot is needed. In fact, the first time I wrote a lot of mistakes in my driver, so you'd be 
<laughs> USB set was really uh, flying somewhere. <laughs> and so it crashed my system. So be careful. If you use it on your workstation, you may be going to reboot. On the target part, the, where we're going, uh, you have our EUDC to test. We have to use, for instance, the gadget zero is pretty sufficient to perform the tests. And of course, our UDC, something to test. So on the target, just load the, the gadget and on the host, load the, the, the module, then ask for some tests. We can also perform some tests on easier constraints where they are supported by the gadget zero. And in this case, we have to load the USB test module using telling it to use the alternate settings, so alternate equal one. I used also some pre-composed gadget. <coughs> For instance, I used the master wage gadgets. This one is pretty interesting because it holds some endpoints. So it's really useful to test the alt feature of the, the endpoint. I also use the Ethernet gadget. This one uses transfer size that are really not a multiple of the max packet size. Also, it is very really useful to test so the transfer is well span over multiple packets that the last packet cannot be or is less than the max packet size. All of this kind of stuff related to some kind of size alignment. And I use also the gadget serial because in a pretty basic configuration, each by itself is good. So it is really easy to test pretty short packets and easy to isolate some transfers. So a few words from the master wage. If the alt feature is not well implemented, it's really easy to see errors appear. So on the target, create a file backend for the master wedge and load the gadget. On the host, a new USB removable device appeared. So play with this disk, formatting the disk, transferring some data to the disk, and so on. If there is no error, it's quite good. If there is no error, look at the alt feature. <laughs> the gadget Ethernet. <coughs> Uh, one thing interesting is you have one UDC USB request per Ethernet packet. And also, when the, the UDC completes the request, giving it back to the core, the request size is exactly the Ethernet packet size. So on the target, load the gadget, maybe a little bit of configuration to set the IP address, and then the WGET, some files from your host, and on the OS, run a web server, <coughs> look at the Ethernet transfer size using first Voyager Shaft, for instance, and be sure there is a matching in the, in the Ethernet size and the USB request size when uh, the request is complete. The gadget serial, so each correct type on the host is equal, and when you hit enter, the wall buffer is equal. I do that on the target, loading the gadget, and I did a simple loop back. Cut the device redirected to the device itself. <laughs> on the host, I open and play with the CTY using, for instance, just a pico So that's the end of my uh, presentation. I hope you enjoy it, and uh, it's now time for any questions. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, there are uh, there is a limited amount of um, EPs per device. So and I know that 
there is also a limited amount of EPs per controller. Is this only in hardware or is it also related somehow to the driver? Uh, in fact, first of all, it is related to the standards. We can have only 16 endpoints uh, for in and other 16 for output. And uh, the hardware can handle 16, not more because it is really unuseful, but also some hardware handle less endpoint than this, uh, this limit. So depending on the hardware. Yeah, this is per device. And now I'm asking about per controller. Say one device implements four in yeah. total, and other device implements more, and the customer can connect many hubs and whatever. Well, Where is the limit? <coughs> the limit is the, the transaction level you have in order to, um, to have the recipient of the transaction, whatever the transaction is, is transfer, bulk, is equals, and so on. Uh, during the setup packet, you have to set the recipient of the transaction. So you have the device address up to 128. So that's the number of devices available on the system bus, including apps, apps are devices. And you have to set the endpoint number. And you can only use the 16. So you have 16 in and 16 out. So you have 16 endpoints per device. And Perhaps I can chime in, uh, at least on the BeagleBone Black, there's indeed a limit on the maximum number of endpoints you can connect to the system. So I, I run into that limit, so I'm aware of that. <laughs> Excuse me? Uh, yeah, it depends on what kind of device it is. So a CDC, ACM serial requires three endpoints, which is really bad. So, for example, I had using, ah, was yeah, using I a TNC with three virtual serial ports, which means it consumes nine endpoints. So I cannot connect more than two of them to one BeagleBone Black. In fact, it depends on each function provided by the, by, by the device. And even more, in a multifunction device, the endpoints are global to the device. So if you have a multifunction device, scanner, printer, we say anything, but scanner, printer, if it's a scanner, need two endpoints in the full pool of endpoint device there is these two endpoints already used by one of the functions. So just a, a few less than 16 available from the next, uh, the next function. And some functions are using quite a lot of endpoints. It's not a question, just a comment, just as a data point. The STM32 also has limited FIFO space for the endpoints, and you need to configure the device tree how you want to do it. So that's also a limitation that you need to take into account. Thank you. So when I tried to play with the gadget, I found a raw gadget interface, slash dev slash raw gadget, and I found it quite nice to use because all my code could stay in the user space. Is there some disadvantage to doing this? To do what? To just use a raw gadget interface from kernel and do the stuff completely in the user space? I don't know. But in fact, I think that from the user space is going to have the, the visibility on function, function levels on the user space. So I'm not sure they're going to test the ga really gadget part from the USB, except with test USB. And you have a specific module and ask the module to perform some test. Maybe someone yeah, yeah. know? To, to comment on that, uh, so raw gadgets is meant for debugging purposes only. And if you want uh, your function implemented in user space, you want function FS these days. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, for example, one of ADB incarnations was implemented on top of fun function FS, so there are real life use cases. And every now and then I 
get asked by people uh, under my blog at Collabra. Uh, I blogged about integrating with systemd. So in, uh, every now and then people keep asking me about that. So I guess there are use cases, like real life use cases for function FS. Okay, thanks a lot.